Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, webinar masterclass. So we're doing webinar two uh, of our ongoing series of ensuring the accurate uh, classification of variants in BRCA1, BRCA2 and HRR gene variants. Um, next slide, please. Just a few uh, important housekeeping uh, duties first of all for me. Uh, so please can you make sure that your microphone is muted. Uh, we don't want to obviously uh, interrupt the flow of the speakers with any background noise. Um, for note, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, if any, you or if any of your colleagues are unable to access it just now, uh, we will hopefully make it available in sometime in the next month or so, uh, once it's gone through compliance checks with uh, AstraZeneca and Merck. Uh, and of course, we'll let you know when that's taken place. Uh, they'll then be available on our websites as well, GenQA and EMQM websites for you to download and watch at your leisure. Um, an important part of these webinars is the educational component. Really, it's about your feedback and you asking your questions to the panelists. So to do that, uh, we would please ask you to use the Q&A function, not the chat, but the Q&A function, which would appear at the bottom of your menu bar for Zoom. Uh, to submit your questions, uh, which we'll then hopefully get around to answering at least some of them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. An important point, please, when you're doing, when you are submitting your Q&A uh, 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 questions, is to make sure you define which variant you're applying that question to. So please state variant one question, etc. So we can obviously triage the data and, and ask the relevant questions to the relevant presenters. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so feedback is also really important for us. Uh, so we do listen to everything you say. We've, we've, we've taken into account a lot of the previous feedback. Um, it helps us make sure that these, these training sessions are really valuable and, and educational for you uh, and for your colleagues as well. Um, so after this, e after this presentation, you will get an email um, asking you to complete a short survey, which we'll then use to help facilitate our feedback uh, and ensure that following webinars you know, meet your requirements. Um, should only take about two minutes to complete, but um, it's really important, please, if you do that, that we, we get your responses. Next slide, please. So we've got a fantastic day lined up or webinar lined up. Uh, we've got um, three fantastic speakers. So Trudy McDevitt from Dublin in Ireland, Ian uh, Mesenkamp uh, from Nijmegen in the Netherlands and Andrew Morani from Alberta in Canada. Thank you very much indeed, guys, for your commitment to this project. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your, your presentations today. Uh, and uh, lined up with me, your chair is my co-chair uh, and by far the more, more professional of the two of us, Dr. or Professor, Sa Professor Sandy Deans from uh, GenQA. Uh, so between me and Sandy, we'll be moderating the, the Q&A sessions and doing a little bit of the introduction either side of the, of the uh, panellists. So without uh, any further ado, it's, I'll hand over to my colleague Sandy to take us forward on the next session. Thank you very much, Simon, um, for a very kind introduction. So if we just move through the slides now, please. Thank you. Just a disclaimer here for all of us presenting today. And then next slide. So just to put this webinar in context, we are now um, delivering run eight of the GTAP varying classifications assessment. Um, and today we're going to give an overview of our participation. It has just closed, so we're just starting to review the data. Um, we have our expert panel who's going to give you um, a bit of background of the variants and how they have come to their cl classifications and what evidence has been used. Um, and then obviously we will follow up with the EQ a summary report from this run um, that you can then look at more in more detail and we'll have a lot more discussion for you um, for your education and learning going forward. So next slide please. Just to put it in context, um, this variant assessment is an individual based assessment. It's not laboratory based. We have other EQAs that assess the laboratory's um, standard of variant assessment. This is very much for an individual and it's about um, competency assessing. So, so you are able to demonstrate that you can um, accurately assess the pathogenicity of sequence variants. 
So it's delivered through the Genomics Training Assessment and Competency Tool known as GTACT. And the idea here is you can go onto your online account, you can use them, um, access different task scenarios um, of which the variant assessment is one of them. Um, and these are constantly reviewed. We do SNVs, CNVs and, and other elements as well. So please do take a look. Um, and it works really well for these particular um, variant EQAs. So next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of the data that we've had a, a look at for the first um, time for the assessment of run eight. So it was delivered during the month of June. We had 534 um, individuals register. And as we also, we see with other previous runs that this sometimes drops um, and the number of participants was actually 400. Um, and this is covered by um, individuals based in 54 different countries. So it's really nice to see the global spread of participation and I think that just identifies um, how poignant and, and important pathogenicity classification is across um, all areas of genomic medicine now. So as I say, we had a, a wide number of countries um, being representative and the graph at the top here just gives a summary of those countries whereby we have more than 10 registrants. So we do have um, lower numbers in other um, countries, but it's nice to see that we are consistently getting high representation across all of the continents. One of the other things that's very important to look at is the classification guidelines that are being used. Um, so this is a snapshot of what was used in run eight. Um, you can see here that the majority are still predominantly using the CMG 2015 guidelines alone as a standalone document and point of reference. However, we do see that um, predominantly the UK based um, participants are also using a combination of these guidelines plus the ACGS guidance which is a, a UK-based um, guidance document. We're also seeing a proportion of um, individuals then moving on to also include the CANVIG UK guidance. Um, and then we always have a smattering of those who are using other um, guidance documents or a combination of multiple different um, resources. So next slide, please. What's really interesting as well with the EQA participation is you can actually start looking at trends and seeing and monitor and identify any changes. Um, it's really nice to look back on, on run um, seven compared to the data for this run. And you can see here that the main change is that as an increase in the use of um, ACGS guidelines along with ACMG. So we've seen an increase um, of those have, have reduced because more people are now using the CANVIG UK guidelines. So we see an increase from 28, 18% um, up to 28%. So I think it's the raising the awareness through these educational um, webinars and the, the guidance webinar that we produced earlier in this year and last year, that people are becoming more aware of more resources um, and guidance that they can use and adapt, particularly for the HRR genes and BRC1 and BRC2. So I think it's um, really good evidence that people are changing their practice um, and hopefully learning from that. So next slide please. We were over the, the last few years, well from 2017, you can see here that we have consistently um, had good levels of participation for all of the EQA runs. Um, we have looked at expanding into the HRR genes and, and run seven really was just focused on HRR, but the feedback we're getting from the participants and yourselves is very much due to just mimic clinical practice, you don't know what's coming in the door, you don't know which genes are going to have the variants in them, so they much prefer to have that range of um, BRC1 and 2 plus also the HRR gene variants included, hence the change of format for 2022 whereby we've had all of the genes included in both runs. So next slide please. The, this is a summary um, and I guess for the first time you can see the expected classification of the variants that were included in run eight and you can see here that we have focused both on the ends of the, the spectrum so we have pathogenic class 5 BRCA1 variant and two class 1 um, variants so we'd be looking for very clear definitions of those pathogenicities for those three variants. And then also we know that to determine whether a variant is a, a class three or it can be moved up due to evidence basis to a, a four um, or a 
a two, then we've put in three challenging um, um, variants in there that come out at class three. So our expert panels are going to um, describe what evidence they've used um, and the challenges of, of moving them out of the class three variant um, classification. So next slide, please. We have great news. We can see here again, using trending data analysis across the EQAs, that we're seeing a real improvement in the accuracy um, and the sort of the consistency of variant classification. We have now in this run 13% um, of individuals who are classifying all six variants in line with the expert panel and expected classification, um, and also see a real shift into more um, variants being correctly classified. So I think. This is a real um, ex good example of how continued participation in EQA and also educational webinars actually can really benefit um, genomic medicine and the patient service that we do provide to um, everyone through the, the global labs. So I will stop talking about general stats and, and data now and hand over to the expert panel. Um, Arjun, I think I'm coming to you to kick us off with the first variant, which is an ATM variant. So. Over to you now, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, I'm Arjen Mensenkamp. I'm a clinical laboratory geneticist in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. And I would like to discuss the first variant uh, on the list, indeed, a variant in ATM. Next slide, please. It's a missense variant, um, asparagine 8, 14 to glutamine. Um, it's a missense variant, uh, glutamate, I'm sorry. It's a missense variant. And, uh, outside the known functional domains, at least outside the known clinical relevant domains. Next slide, please. And it is mentioned in ClinVar many times, 17 times, most of them uh, with the benign classification. Um, LFD, it has been mentioned as benign and likely benign. It is present in NOMAD, and we chose here the non-cancer female version 211 uh, database and where it is present in 0.02% in all individuals and specifically 2.4% in the African-Americans. Uh, it also contains eight homozygotes for this variant. The REFL prediction score, a, a prediction that includes um, many other prediction tools and uh, so it accommodates the more classical uh, prediction tools, uh, comes on a score of 0.34. Um, uh, which is higher than 0.249, the, the, the level of a benign variant. Um, the CIF polyphen didn't uh, agree, and a line GVGD came up with the C0, so um, towards benign. Next slide, please. So our classification was as follows. Um, there was no evidence favoring pathogenicity. And uh, we have evidence favoring B9. As we have a BA1, the official category is allele frequency over 5% in convo cohorts, but that is the general rule, um, also applicable for recessive disease. For a dominant disease, in which we now here view this variant, um, we have a 0.19% in NOMAD in total, um, but in the African American non cancer cohort, is, two, is uh, almost two and a half percent heterozygosity, which is far over the limit of 0.5 percent as given for uh, ATM. I will come back to that later. Uh, in addition, but of course, BA1 is a standalone um, criterion already, so that will make enough to make it class one. But BP2 can also be considered, and um, as this has been observed in trends, the homozygous. Um, in presumably healthy individuals in the NOMAD database. It has a slightly lower power if it is in a database according to the, at least to the Kenefic UK rules and to the ATM rules, but uh, it can be even applied as this strong evidence. Um, but again, it's not necessary as PA1 is sufficient. Next slide, please. Um, you, our participants, uh, agree with the class one classification in far the majority, um, but still almost 100 participants chose class two, likely benign. Of course, both will have a similar outcome uh, in the reporting. Um, um, so next slide, I would like to give some explanations. Um, 
there is always some debate what kind of data set you can use for uh, classifying BA, for BA1. Uh, the African population is the, the, the tested, the size of the tested samples is, is quite big and is normally large enough to make classification like this. Um, uh, but two and a half percent in that population is over 0.5. And that is um, specified in the uh, variant creation expert panel for ATM. It's a, it's a ClinGen effort for expert panel on, on ATM uh, breast cancer variation. And uh, the rules from the VSAP has been replaced uh, by the Cancer UK. Um, it, it replaced their own rules. So um, we will continue with the ATM specific rules as, as, as the standard for ATM. Um, they apply to 0.5% as a cover for uh, BA1. So BS1 is not applicable as the frequency is over half percent. The BS2 is an observed in a healthy adult individual is not applicable for breast cancer for ATM as the penetrance is reduced. So you can only use that for high penetrance variants. Um, BB4 is also a good one, but if you follow Revel, and that is written in the PSAP ATM classification as the sole source of classifications, the score is 0.34, which is too high to call it BP4. Um, BP6, what has been used by some of you, so that is expert opinion, is by using a, a clean gen uh, rule is discontinued. Um, next slide, please. Now I'll hand over now to the next presenter, uh, presenter and that is Trudy. Thank you, Arne. So I'm going to just um, bring you through two BRCA1 variants that are on opposite ends of the pathogenicity spectrum, but with very similar categories of evidence applied for their class classification. So next slide, please. So the first variant is a missense variant in BRCA1, um, the prior risk of pathogenicity is therefore unknown, and it's a clinically significant residue in the BRCT domain, met methionine 1775. So next slide, please. It's reported um, as pathogenic widely. So there are seven submissions on ClinVar since 2018 when um, the ACMG guidelines would have been um, applied, um, and it includes Enigma, which gives it a pathogenic score. So it has a three star rating on ClinBar. It's pathogenic on LOVD, on BRCA exchange with the Enigma data. On NOMAD, there on the NOMAD non cancer females data set, it's present in one individual in greater than 50,000 individuals. So that's a, a frequency of 0.0019%. The REVEL score for this variant is 0.728 and other um, in silico tools um, also support pathogenicity. So next slide, please. So we didn't report any um, evidence favoring benignity and the evidence that we agreed um, to be applied for pathogenicity um, are, are as indicated in this table. So starting with BS3 at a strong level, this is um, functional evidence and we based it on um, two functional studies that have been validated using the BANIC assessment, validated for use um, with PS3 at a strong level. So that's Findlay et al and Bowman et al. So we could apply PS, PS3 strong um, to this variant. We also use PP1 strong. Um, now this is um, based on the multifactorial analysis um, by Enigma. And we use the latest CANVIG um, guidelines that allow you to convert multifactorial um, data likelihood ratio scores to ACMG evidence points, which means that you can more appropriately use data that maybe would previously been, have given you um, a BP5 supporting. You can now give it the, the weighting it uh, deserves really. So we, um, the multifactorial data for segregation gives, um, it has a likelihood ratio for odds of causality at 229. So this converts to 7.42 ACMG evidence points, which gives you a strong for pathogenicity for segregation. Um, we also apply PP3 based on the REVEL score of 0.2728 and also PM2 supporting 
um, given the one individual in greater than 50,000, which reaches, re reaches the threshold for PM2 use of um, uh, less than 0 0.002 in um, a control cohort of greater than 50,000. So with too strong and too supporting, we've already got class five. So next slide, please. Other evidence which we agreed could be applied is PS4 at a supporting level, whereby the variant prevalence in affected individuals incre is increased compared to controls. There are five cases on the UK um, database, um, but the ethnicity of the cases isn't available. So we, you couldn't perform case control analysis because you need to use matched um, ethnically, ethnically matched controls. There are 19 um, breast cancer families in the Rebecca Rebe et al. publication of um, nearly 30,000 um, families. And uh, also the fact that PM2 is applicable, all this evidence allows you to use PS4 at a supporting level on um, a case counting basis. We also agreed that PM5 at a supporting level could be used. This is where there's another missense variant out there that's in the same position and widely reported as pathogenic. So in this case, variant BRCA1 um, 5324T to A rather than T to G um, is reported as pathogenic. So this is methionine at 1775 um, changed to lysine. There are a couple of caveats with using PM5 supporting. Um, the first one being that your, the REVEL score of the variant, your, your variant and the variant you're comparing it to um, need to be such that your variant has a higher REVEL score or um, is stronger in in, for the in silico tools. Um, in this case, the two REVEL scores were almost identical. So therefore we downgraded it to use it at, as supporting. The other caveat is that if the variant you are comparing it to is only pathogenic or likely pathogenic because you're using functional studies, um, then you can't use PM5 and PS3 for your own variant. So in this case, um, the variant we're comparing it to reaches at least class four without using the functional evidence that's available for it. So we can use PM5 at a supporting level and we can also use PS3. So all of that gives a comfortable class three pathogenic score. So next slide, please. So you can see that um, about 92% of um, participants reported a class five and a small number class four. So the clinical um, actionability of the outcomes is the same. So that's really good. Um, we did notice though in the class three participants that there were a significant number that actually pla cla um, classified the variant as class five. But when you look at the evidence, there wasn't quite enough to get it to class five and there should have been a class four. And also for some of the class fives, only class five was, was entered without um, accompanying evidence, um, probably potentially based on the Enigma classification. So uh, next slide, please. So looking at it in a bit more detail, about um, approximately 90% returned class five using the evidence that's listed there. We found that um, it was hard to tell the difference actually between those re uh, reporting class five and class four, because the similar evidence was used, but just at different levels, so that those using class four didn't quite get to um, level five based on the strengths that they'd, they'd applied. But we'll probably, um, I'll cover that in a bit more detail in the report. Um, so class four, fewer um, participants used um, strong, including the use of PP1 at a strong level. PM5, most participants actually applied this at a moderate level, but as, as explained earlier, the REVEL scores are virtually the same, so it, we need to downgrade it to a supporting level. PP5, so this is, has a similar theme now to the next variant I'm going to discuss. So different strengths were submitted for PP5. Um, it's important to note that if you are using PP5 based on reports from a reputable source, so ClinVar's submission since 2018, including um, Enigma, you can only use PP5 at, PP5 at a supporting level. Um, and if you are extracting the data from Enigma to use um, according to the individual components for the multifactorial data, then you can use um, 
you can then apply it at a, at a stronger level, which is what we did using PP1 at Strong. But you need to be careful that if you're doing this, you don't also use PP5 because then you're using the same evidence um, more than once. Um, PS4, uh, there was a range of um, strengths applied for this, but only supporting applies in this case. PM1, it does impact a clinically significant residue in BRCT in the BRCT domain, but PM1 cannot be used with PS3, according to the combinations that are um, laid out in the latest CANVIC guidelines. The PM2 and PP3 different strengths were also applied to these, but only supporting applies. Um, so next slide, please. So classification of variant three, next slide three, please. So this variant was at the um, opposite end of the spectrum. It's an in-frame deletion. And the, risk, the prior risk of pathogenicity is unknown. Next slide, please. Multiple reports on ClinVar of benignity since 2018 and um, a three-star rating because uh, Enigma also classified it as benign. On LOVD, there's a mix of classifications, um, BRCA exchange, which, which is the Enigma data, it's classified as benign. On NOMAD, there are six um, individuals in um, the cohort of greater than 50,000 on the non-cancer females database. So giving a frequency of 0.0112%, which is higher than is allowed for PM2. Um, in silico prediction tools, there's for, for splicing, there's no predicted impact on splicing. So next slide, please. Um, so there was no evidence favoring pathogenicity and for uh, benignity, we applied BP6 at a strong level, similar to the previous variants by extracting the um, multifactorial data from the um, Enigma um, submission in Parsons et al. So doing that and using the table in the latest CANVIC guidelines, you can get a strong for benignity. And we also applied BS3 strong based on validated functional studies um, that allow you to use BS3 at a strong level um, Bowman et al. 20, um, 20, 2020. So already we've got a class one benign because we've got two strong pieces of evidence. Um, additional evidence that we did discuss um, as a group, um, there's an error here, so my apologies, this should be BP3 supporting, not strong, so sorry, sorry about that. But we did discuss and agree that it could be used um, for an in-frame um, deletion in a region that Scott is, is not well conserved. So we agreed that BP3 at a supporting level could also be used. Um, next slide, please. So the summary of the classifications, um, the expected was class one, um, but most uh, participants returned um, a class two and a small number also class three. But for the class one and two, the clinical action actionability um, outcome is the same again, so that's that's good as well. We noticed again that um, there some of the uh, class two participants actually should have been a class three because they used evidence for benignity and pathogenicity, um, and some of the class ones um, should have been a class two because they only had one strong piece of evidence. Um, so next slide, please. So for class one, you needed two strong pieces of evidence. Um, in this case, we um, applied BS3 and P BP6 as strong. So the difference between the two is really that those in class two, in most cases, didn't apply a second strong piece of evidence um, to get them into class one. So again, we'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail in the report. BP6, this is really similar to the PP5 previously, um, that if you are using it based on reputable source, so that's the ClinVar submissions plus the, including the Enigma, BP6 supporting only can be applied. And if you're extracting the multifactorial data, um, you can use BP6 strong. Um, but again, you need to be careful that you're not using BP6 supporting with um, the individual components for the multifactorial analysis uh, pulled out of it, because it's using the same um, um, evidence twice. BS1 and PM2 were applied by significant numbers of participants, but these don't apply in this case. In the case of PM2, um, there are too many cases on NOMAD for PM2 
to be applied. And in the case of BS1, there aren't enough cases on NOMAD to be able to apply this. If you um, look at the CardioDB um, tool, the uh, maximum tolerated allele count um, for the variant in the NOMAD population that you're looking at is actually 15 females, and we've got six females. So neither of these um, lines of evidence for population um, data can be applied. PM4 was actually applied by um, a significant number of participants. And you can see why this might have been um, applied. It's for an in-frame deletion of a single amino acid at a supporting level. However, you need to be um, cognizant of the conservation of the amino acid. It needs to be a highly conserved amino acid for PM4 to be applied. And this um, amino acid at position 369 if you apply the conserve tool, you get uh, five, and the range is one for low conservation and nine for high. So it's moderately conserved at best, so it wouldn't be appropriate to apply PM4. Um, in addition, applying it at a, um, a, a low uh, supporting level is, is minor in the, in the background of the very, very strong evidence for benignity for this variant. BP4 was applied also by significant numbers. Um, now, we didn't apply this because um, BP4, um, the in silico tools are designed for missense variants um, and the effect on um, protein function. Um, potentially, participants might have applied it based on the um, no impact on splicing that was maybe used for BP3. But um, this variant had a low uh, prior probability of having an effect on splicing to start with. And BP4 for in frame um, deletions is not really covered in the guidelines currently. There will be some guidance um, from the Enigma group for BP4 use for um, in -frame, um, small in-frame deletions in the near future, but, but at the moment we agreed not, uh, we didn't use BP4. So next slide please. So now um, I'll hand you over to um, Andrew for variant four. Thank you Trudy. Uh, next slide please. All right, so variant four is a BRCA2 variant. It's a missense variant at nucleotide uh, 202. It's an A2G. Um, the prior risk, uh, risk of pathogenicity is unknown, and it's not in a functional domain. Next slide, please. So uh, this variant is in ClinVar. Uh, it's a two-star rating, two submissions. It's also an LOVD. It's not present in the NOMAD non-cancer group. It's got a rebel score of 0 0.101. Uh, CIF and polyphen are contradicting and align GVGD uh, suggests uh, towards benignity as with mutation tasting. Next slide, please. So evidence for uh, favoring pathogenicity include PM2 supporting, uh, this is if you are using the ACMG guidelines. Evidence towards uh, favoring this variant being benign is uh, BP4 supporting. So the REVEL score of 0 0.101 would qualify, as uh, also three out of four in silico prediction tools also estimate this to be tolerated. And it's in a poorly conserved amino acid. So according to ACMG guidelines, you would have a PM2 supporting and a BP4 supporting, which would uh, give you a class three or a variant of uncertain significance. Next slide, please. So this is where it gets a little interesting. If you're using the Canvig UK guidelines, uh, you use the evidence slightly differently for this. So uh, being absent from NOMAD would qualify for a PM2 moderate. You would also have the BP4 supporting because of the REVEL score. But uh, using guidance from the BRCA1 and 2 specific Canvig UK guidelines, you can also use BP1 supporting as it's not in the DVD domain of the gene. Uh, you still arrive at a class three, a variant of uncertain significance, but you do have a different evidence or a slightly modified evidence to get you to this point. Next slide, please. So the majority of participants classified this as, as expected as a variant of uncertain significance. However, there were a few that classified this as likely benign and likely pathogenic. Uh, 
or only one is likely pathogenic. Um, the reason for the individuals classifying this as likely benign uh, weren't always completely, so not all the evidence that was used to arrive at this classification was clicked off. It seems it could be because they used the two benign pieces of evidence, but didn't use the uh, rare or absent from population databases. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see which guidelines these individuals were specifically following, but I suppose it's possible if they were using the Canvig UK guidelines and did not use the, the evidence that this variant was rare, uh, that could be how they arrived at the likely benign, as that seems to be the evidence that was used. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, now I'll bring you back to our, our first speaker. Yes, I will continue with the PLB2 variant. Um, so next slide, please. This concerns a missense variant in PLB2, uh, tryptophan 912 Um It is present in the WD40 repeat, which is um, known for its interaction with uh, BSCA2 and RET51, amongst others. Next slide, please. For this variant, um, we checked the databases. It is not present in FinVAR at the moment. It is present in LWD, but without classification. The variant is not present in NOMAD, and the REVEL score is 0.56. Sift and polypen are both deleterious, and the line GVGD is C65, which is also deleterious. So it is a very um, highly suspicious variant on the basis of the, these resources. Next slide, please. Um, there is no evidence favoring uh, uh, that this is a benign variant. Uh, we came up with uh, three applicable criteria for pathogenicity. The first one is PS3 moderate, a well-established in vivo or in vitro functional study. And for that, we used the Bolin study published in 2019, which showed a 90 to 95% reduction in homologous recombination and sensitivity to PARP inhibitors. Uh, compared to triggering variants. Um, we assessed this assay uh, by the privilege previously mentioned Burnage uh, method and applied it at a moderate level. I will come back to that later. The, as the variant is not present in NOMAD, you can apply PM2 supporting according to the HCMG criteria. And, um, uh, but if applying the Canada UK guidelines, you can apply it at a moderate level. Uh, the next is the PP3, which is also a difficult one for here. Uh, multiple in silico tools, as the one I just mentioned, predict a deleterious effect, but not all. I will come back to that in the next slides. Uh, so using these three criteria, we came up with a DOS classification plus three. Next slide, please. As you can see, the majority of uh, 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 participants uh, agreed with that classification but a large group of people came up with a likely pathogenic classification, um, most likely due to a, a different uh, use of PS3 uh, classification. Next slide, please. Um, and now we'll come back to that now for, the, for this essay. Like I said, the variant is tested in the Bowden paper and as a deleterious variant. And then the next question is how to use this, how to use this knowledge in variant classification. Well, for that, we uh, used the Burnage paper to weight this essay. And according to this paper, you first have to ask the question, does this test fulfill disease mechanism? Well, the question is yes, it is testing loss of function. And it is testing homologous recombination, which is assuming to be the, the proper functional output. And the, the next obvious question is, does the test take basic controls into account? Does it use at least two replicates? Does it include positive and negative controls? It does. And then if you really want to calculate the, the, the odds of being pathogenic, you also need to take into account the number of controls that have been incorporated. And in the branch paper, there's a very nice uh, Excel sheet available, which you can use for that. 
And they've used in this paper 20 controls from which 12 were pathogenic truncating variants and um, combining that with the functional outcome and it was completely uh, uh, fulfilling the, 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 so the 12 pathogenic variants came out with a, a deleterious effect and the HP9 variants came up with a, a functionally normal outcome. You can calculate the, the pathogenicity, which is eight for being pathogenic and uh, not for, not eight for being benign. And um, next slide and next slide. Uh, that gives the uh, osteopathogenicity of eight, and if you then convert that to an evidence strength equivalent, um, based on several papers, also by Pertigian et al., a number of eight uh, osteopathogenicity uh, applies to be high in the PS3 moderate range. So, therefore, we applied this essay at a moderate strength. Next slide. So, we applied this for the uh, in this masterclass. However, we know that the, uh, the expert panel for PELB2 from uh, FinGen will likely not support any functional test at all, as virtually no pathogenic missions variants are known at this moment. So the essay was validated using truncating variants, but you would, of course, also like that some pathogenic missions variants are taken into account. Um, the same is that for now, there are no missions variants known that are pathogenic, uh, it is not possible to validate functional tests um, at all. So um, that does not alter the classification of this variant, but it is something that we need to take into account. Therefore, classification of the VUS. Next slide, please. Um, we also applied PP3 supporting using uh, as multiple prediction models suggested a deleterious effect. However, the reference score is too low for that. Gafford UK guidelines um, suggest only to use the REFL score and not a combination of all tools. And uh, therefore, according to the Gafford UK rules, you cannot apply PP3 support. Uh, the other way around into the benign variant, uh, BP1 can be considered uh, as well. As just I mentioned, missense variants in PLB2 are uh, uh, extremely rare at most, uh, if at all present. And uh, therefore, BP1 can be applied. And this is also a recommendation, a specific recommendation in the Kentrick UK guidelines. Um, so these are alternatives that could have been chosen. Next slide, please. And I will hand over back to Trudy. No, not to Trudy, to uh, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and next slide, please. All right, so the last variant is the RAD 51D. It's a frame shift variant. Um, prior risk of pathogenicity is unknown, and it's in the C-terminus of the ATPase domain. Next slide, please. So the data, ClinVar has one submission for this variant, and classified as being of uncertain significance. It is not present in the NOMAD non-cancer database, and is not present in HGMD. Next slide, please. So evidence favoring this variant being benign, uh, we weren't able to find any. Evidence favoring this variant being pathogenic uh, is PBS1 moderate. This is a frame shift in the last exon of the gene, and it disrupts less than 10% of the coded protein sequence. It's predicted to escape nonsense mediated decay, and so that arrives at a PBS moderate. And a PM2 supporting, as for the ACMG guidelines, as this is absent from the NOMAD database. However, if you're using the Canvic UK guidelines, once again, this becomes PM2 moderate. So there's a slight difference in the strength of evidence you use here, but it still arrives at a class three, a variant of uncertain significance. Next slide, please. So uh, the majority of individuals classified this as expected as a variant of uncertain significance. However, there was a significant number of individuals who classified this as pathogenic or likely pathogenic. And the main reason for this is uh, the use of the PVS1. Next slide, please. These individuals use PVS1 at a, a strength higher than the moderate strength recommended. I just thought I'd quickly take a, a moment to go over the Italian publication that goes over the PVS1 decision tree. 
So we have a non-sensor frame shift variant, which is in the last exon, so it's not predicted to undergo non-sense mediated decay. Although this variant is found in a domain, it's not in a critical region of that domain or a highly conserved region of that domain. Uh, and there aren't very many, uh, I don't think there are any pathogenic missense variants in that region. So the role of the region in the protein function is unknown. It's a loss of function variant uh, that's not frequent in the general population and is present in a biologically relevant transcript and less than 10% of the protein is predicted to be removed, which arrives at PBS1 moderate. And this is just a schematic of, it's a review article of the common pathogenic, non-pathogenic variants in RAD51D. And you can see at the tail end here where our variant is found, there really isn't, there really aren't any recurrent uh, pathogenic variants. So it's unknown if this region is critical for protein function, specifically where this is. The conserved region is way over here, which is a few exons over. And so I think that is the main uh, reason why individuals got to a higher classification than variant of uncertain significance for this variant. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Andrew, very much indeed. And thank you to all three of our expert panel for a very comprehensive review of the six variants and, and a, a, a dis great discussion and, and information on why um, they've been classified in that way. So this is just a snapshot of the classifications um, looking across the six of them in a, a whole. Um, I just want to flag one error here on the slide that variant three, the expected classification is actually class one. Um, so the green and blue are switched around the wrong way. And I believe this may be the case on the report on the GTAC system. So we'll make sure that's corrected um, urgently so you um, can download your updated reports. So I think um, generally, looking at this as a, an overview, we can see that the size of the unexpected classification bubbles um, are reducing, um, and that's a reflection of the, the data that we presented at the, the top of the webinar, whereby um, more and more individuals are classifying in line with the expert panel and using the same evidence. So I think, again, just a, another um, evidence that we really are all, all learning um, at the same time and that these educational webinars are, are really worth the while. So I believe there's quite a few questions in the Q&A function now, so um, please do put the, your question in if you've not already done so. Um, and as Simon requested, if you could just start by saying which variant your question is related to, um, so we can actually pick off our expert panel one by one and make sure they're answering the right case for us. So Simon, I'll hand back to you then to start us off. Yep, thank you very much indeed, Sandy. So um, you're doing a great job, uh, uh, participants. We've got lots of questions for our panelists. Uh, I'm going to actually kick off with a question for, I think it is Trudy for variant three. Uh, so Trudy, for variant three, what are the differences in the evidence criteria applied for those reporting class one and class two? Um, so it's um, it's it's for, for, to class to choose class one. You need two strong pieces of evidence. So it it simply looks like the same range of evidence has been used by both sets of participants, but those using class two just used one piece of evidence at a strong level. So that seems to be the main difference. It's just the the strength that's used for the for the variance. Right. Okay. So really, that's the that's the main differentiator yeah, between those two results. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I suppose it's just the take home from that is just to look at the strengths that you're applying and make sure they're they're being applied appropriately. Just check all um, guidelines for that yeah. because there is a lot of information on the correct strength to use. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. I've got a question here for uh, Arian. Arian, sorry. Um, so with I think it's variant. Is it variant four? Power B two iron. Five. Um, five. What uh, what would be needed to classify this variant as a likely pathogenic class five, class four? Yeah, that's a uh, difficult question. Um, I, I, as also because this variant is very rare, so we need to have more families with this variant, and it would be even better if we can do any segregation analyses in these families. And if you also can prove that these all these tumors are HR deficient. 
And perhaps if we have multiple independent uh, functional assays that point in the same direction, um, we might get, be able to get to class four because yeah, if you look at it, your first suggestion is it might be class four. And it is also some people from the participants chose class four. Um, but we have to be careful here. We have examples, for example, for CDH1, where a functional assay was completely misinterpreted and missense variants were classified too high on the basis of functional assays. So we should be careful here with applying a functional outcome before knowing that missense variants are pathogenic at all. I mean, it's, it, you, make, you make an interesting point, a general point there about the, the, the lack of evidence for a lot of these variants in these genes. I mean, it seems, you know, obviously there's really well established data for BRCA1 and 2, but as you start to get into more of the HRR genes, there's clearly a lot less evidence, isn't there, on, on levels of functional uh, effect, effect of all these different variants. So it is becoming much more difficult to actually give a really good classification of the variants. Yes, and also because of the lower penetration penetrance of these variants, mm. it is hard to get really nice uh, uh, penetrance as we know from the, uh, in the olden days, from the BRCA1 and 2 variants that were highly penetrant, very present in yeah. families. Yeah. And that will yeah. not happen for, well, especially not for ATM or CHECK2. Yeah. Um, however, for PALB2, we can assume that HR is the main uh, function of this gene or this protein. And the assays that have been used are really comparable to the assays that have been used for BSCA1 and 2. So yeah, one can assume that yeah, function is the same, outcome is the same, so probably the pathogenicity will be the same. But yeah, we hope to get more evidence for that. Uh, thank you, Aaron. So uh, Sandy, I've got one more question before I move over, uh, hand back to you. So this is a question for Andrew. Uh, so for variant six, um, the frame shift occurs in a domain. So why don't you use PVS1 strong? That's a good question. It, the frame shift does occur in a domain, but when you look at the, the conservation of that domain, the key residues, and there's, there's a functional paper to show this, but the key residues are not disrupted by this. So the key residues are upstream of where this frame shift occurs. And there aren't any, no, there are no, no known pathogenic variants around either upstream or downstream directly near this region. So based on that, it's not quite appropriate to, to assume because it's in a domain that this is functionally relevant, where this, where this change is occurring. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Sandy, over to you. Thank you, Simon. So Trudy, I'm going to come to you. There's quite a few questions here in your, your two BRCA1 um, variants. Um, Firstly, why didn't you use PM4 for the BRCA1 in frame deletion? So that was variant three that was a, a class one. So um, a good number of participants actually did use PM4, mm. but it's, um, it's, it wasn't appropriate to use because it's, um, it needs to be um, an in frame deletion of a residue that's highly conserved. And that wasn't the case for this one. So it wouldn't be um, appropriate to use PM4. Okay, thank you for that. Interesting that many participants did use it as well. Isn't yeah, it? And you, yeah, and you can see why, why they did, you know, because it's an in-frame deletion of a single amino acid. So Yeah, um, there's quite a few questions coming through about um, the other BRCA variant, which was two, variant mm -hmm. two, um, around the, eth the ethnicity <laughs> and the, I can't say yeah, that yeah. word, no, um, really and don't. about the... Um, you know, the, the population database, et cetera. So we'll probably cover that in more depth in the EQA summary report. But just to sort of summarize, so for that variant, why does the PM2 was applied if there was one individual in the African subpopulation um, with less than 50,000 alleles? So according to the, the, the CANVIC guidelines, it's if you're looking at it um, in a subpopulation, it's greater than one in less than 50,000 is my understanding. Um, but we're, we're looking at uh, one um, individual in a total of, of um, greater than 50,000. So we thought it was appropriate to apply PM2 at a supporting level. So I guess it's sort of on that borderline, is, is that you've got yeah. to just be a bit pragmatic and 
yeah. use um, your your own expertise, I guess, don't you? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. So, as I say, we'll cover a bit more of that into in the report because I think it's something that people really are seeking guidance on. Thank you. Simon, do you want to come back to you for another few questions? Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to come back to variant uh, one, actually. So, Iron, so this is, um, please could you explain again why BA1 is fine to use for variant one? Um, well, the easy answer is uh, that is recommended by the, the, the ClinGen ATM variant expert panel, and it is recommended by them uh, to use a 0.5% cutoff, uh, where you can use a calculator for that, uh, that was just mentioned by Trudy, and if you do that, you assume the uh, frequency of breast cancer compared to the penetrance of ATM, which is about uh, 20%. You can calculate what is the maximum likelihood of a variant uh, of a pathogenic variant that still can occur given the prevalence of breast cancer. And well, if you use the calculation either dominant or recessive, uh, you will come up at about half percent as being the maximum frequency of a pathogenic variant to be able to uh, occur in the general population. Thank you, Aya. So um, I think we'll. I, I've, We've got so many questions. It's fabulous to see it, but it's so hard to triage it as well. So please do excuse me while I'm trying to read and actually and uh, assimilate what the questions are as well. But I've got here a question for variant for variant four, which I think was, was that Andrew, I think that was Andrew, wasn't it? So BP one a non-conserved residues. Which parameters should I use to determine conservation? Um, Blossom sixty foot sixty two. No idea what that is, but I'm sure that's relevant to you. Uh, which which is the cutoff for non-conserved residues? That is a very good question. Uh, at the moment, I don't think we have a lot of guidance from uh, ClinGen or Canvig UK specifically for what to set for a conservation, at least none that I'm aware of. So I think these parameters would probably be best to be set internally in your lab and just be consistent. Um, in our lab, we often we're using Alamute, and we're we're uh, using the threshold of if it's not highly conserved. But I suppose others might have a more stringent uh, recommendation. I think with uh, there is in the works a RNA splicing guideline that might be coming out. And I'm hoping that that will give us more guidance as to a specific threshold to use for this. Uh, that is a very good question, though, and unfortunately, I don't have a concrete answer for you. Certainly one I think we could perhaps consider for the scheme report if, if we've got more questions coming in related to that, couldn't we? So um, it, it obviously covers an interesting perspective. Looking at variant five, which I think was iron, so um, would it put... Will it be possible through PS3 moderate for the, would it be possible to do through PS3 moderate for the for that PALP2 variant? How would you consider a, a GFP assay and PARP sens PARP I sensitivity using cellular proliferation assay? Uh, well, the, 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 the bone paper used both a GFP HR uh, assay, that's the, the assay that is being used for almost all uh, homologous recombination genes, and, and, and the prop I inhibitor, but they both more or less use the same outcome and that's homologous recombina uh, recombination. And, but even if they were different, you still end up with the question, are missense variants pathogenic at all? And I'm afraid that's the almost philosophical question that we have to answer first before we can move back to the functional aspect. Yep, I think I think you, you covered that very well in your in the earlier question we just raised, didn't we, about that? So, um, I think Sandy, well, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, just a couple of um, feedback from for us, which is really really helpful. Um, um, so, so sort of can we in the future can we cover maybe guidance on using BP one? Um, as some people are finding it difficult to select BP one based on the domains, is there like a general rule? Maybe we can cover that going forward. Um, also about um, 
can we give future guidance when using PVS1 for variants in the last exomes of the HRR genes? I know that's something that's very topical in these particular gene sets. So I think that's something we could focus some educational um, webinars on. But so I'm going to open. Do any of you want to comment on the use of PVS1 for variants in at the end of the, the coding sequences of these genes? Any sort of top guidance, take home message? Well, I think, for, yeah, so for the gene specific uh, uh, guidelines, and uh, and I think they're also mentioned in the UK cancer guidelines, yeah. uh, specific amino acids are mentioned, which we know that are truncating and uh, give loss of function or associated with cancer. And normally the last one you know is generally assumed as being uh, positive, and that's Beyond, be, be, uh, below that point, you don't know. Uh, and of course, we know that the last exon is not, uh, NMD will not occur for variants in the last exon or in the last parts of the, the one but last exon. And you can use that as a guideline as well. And in the general ACMG guidelines, you, they use the 10% rule as a very general cutoff. But perhaps truly has something to add. I suppose the, the gene specific guidelines would also have um, specific recommendations as well. And there is a really good um, source of information on the Canvig um, website that we can probably put a link to in the reports and so on, where there's very nice presentations um, by James Drummond that does go through this in, in great detail, which is very helpful. Absolutely, that's exactly what I was thinking um, when that popped up. He's a great expert in that, that field, so good call there, Trudy. Um, so Simon, I'm going to just end on one, which is a, a general one again, um, for the recommendation from the panel is, so for all these six variants we've been talking about, the REVEL um, in silico prediction um, tool, is this recommended tool by the panel? Trudy? The REVEL, use of REVEL. Yes. Yeah, there is um, a recommendation now to move towards these um, meta predictor tools um, away from the the the, the multiple um, in silico tools because they they're just more accurate. Um, there are some publications out. I haven't got it to hand, but um, we could perhaps even address that in the report as well. Provide a bit of detail on that. But yes, the recommendation is to move towards these and away from the SIFT and polyfen and um, line GVGD. That's great. Thank you. Andrew, do you agree? We're running out of time, so a quick. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think we're in a transition phase. I think yeah. Uh, yeah. some specific uh, recommendations are suggesting other in silico, but in general, I think that is the shift is going towards level scores. Great. Thank you. Ajahn, anything you want to? Yeah, I know that for BSC 1 and 2, and TP53, base DEL is being recommended. And basically because it also uh, includes indel variants that can be predicted. And um, so, yeah, my revel is, is better than the, the one we previously used. So it is an improvement. Great, thank you all. So Simon, I'll hand back to you to close the session. Yep, thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, and a big thank you to you, the participants. We've had about 150 of you today dialed in, which is brilliant. Uh, we hope you found this educational and helpful to you. Uh, please do make sure you join us for the next run, run nine, I think it is, uh, later on in the year. Um, a big also, big thank you also to our panelists. Your expert knowledge is is uh, unbridled, in, in, and it's fantastic to have you involved in this project and in this webinar series. Uh, so thank you to you for all the time and commitment you put into that as well. Uh, thank you also to our uh, organisers, MSD and AstraZeneca, and most importantly, thank you to my co-host, uh, Sandy Deans. <laughs> Um, we wish you a, a, a successful and enjoyable rest of the day and we'll look forward to catching up with you later on in the year. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.